Good morning, y'all. Man, y'all are way better than the first crowd. <laughs> Did I say that? <clears throat> that was the warm-up crowd. You know, I asked if I could uh, walk up to Eye of the Tiger, and they said no. <laughs> I don't understand. Maybe next time. Um, I got a funny story for y'all. I uh, have a really, really close friend that um, asked me a couple years ago to go with him to a job interview. It's kind of a really unique job interview. Well, see, it's unique to get asked to go to, with somebody to a job interview. You know, you have a wingman to a job interview. So anyway, he's applying to be a, a youth pastor at a church in Huntersville, and I'm like, sure, man, I'll go with you. So it's a unique process. The way they did it there is they actually uh, called him to come before the entire church council and some of the parents of the youth basically for a Q&A. And so... You know, he's like, dude, I just need some support. So we're sitting there, and they're introducing him, you know, and they call him to come up. And he turns, and he hands me his gum. And, <laughs> you know, it's like, well, we're close friends, so I'm okay with that. So I chewed it. <laughs> anyway, so the... So the oh, no. No. All right, there we go. We got rid of the gum. I'll sanitize your stool later, okay. Michael. Uh, anyway, so, well, as we can, I'm not David, and if this is your first time here, if you're watching my video, I'm not David. David's uh, recovering from his uh, knee surgery uh, part deux, and um, I'm the renter reverend. Uh, it's 1-800-renter reverend. We have a 45-minute minimum, but this is the second service, so I guess it doesn't really matter. So, as we continue to talk about uh, prayer, and today we're talking about when you pray, um, we're going to start by uh, addressing the fact that we're going to pray humbly. When you pray, you pray humbly. So, um, here we go. <clears throat> I like definitions. I like to understand the words that I'm reading and what they mean and how they play in. So, we, you're going to see this a lot as we go forward. So, when we pray, we pray humbly. Hum the definition for humble is uh, not proud not thinking of yourself as better than other people. Um, as we're looking at Matthew chapter 6, verse 5, And when you pray, you must not be like the hypocrites, for they just love to stand and pray in the synagogues and at the street corners, that they may be seen by others. Truly I say to you, they have received their reward. Now pause with me for a minute as I pray. Father God, I just thank you for this great day, Lord. I thank you for the opportunity to stand here and uh, bring the word at Christ Community Church. Lord, I just pray for Pastor David as he's recovering from his knee surgery. Lord, I pray that you'll open our hearts today, and uh, Lord, let us just have a great time here together. And Lord, we thank you so much for your grace and your mercy. In Jesus' name, amen. Now, what I really like here is that Jesus is being a little bit condescending when he says to not pray like the hypocrites and how they do it so boastfully. You know, he says, they have received their reward. So, you know, he, he kind of knows what's coming for those folks. As we look on, we see here, when you pray, your prayers aren't to be for anyone but God. Even when there is an audience, prayer isn't a tool to get noticed by others. It is a path to come into the presence and receive the full attention of God. You know, when I see Michael up here leading worship and he's closing his eyes, I always think, man, he is really having a spiritual moment. But really, it's the, his retinas are burning. <laughs> if if y'all all left right now, I wouldn't know. <laughs> um, anyway. Sorry. <laughs> when we pray in a mannerism of humility... We do not have to grovel at his feet, although that would be okay because he is a holy God, but that's not what his expectation is. Um, what he is looking for is sincerity and a contrite heart. Well, what does contrite mean? Contrite means to be remorseful or broken. So as we come to God to pray in humility, we should come with a contrite heart, not proud and boastful, but in a mannerism of remorse and brokenness. Pride is a roadblock between us and God. 
You, sh you should have wrote that one down. <laughs> Let's look at Luke 18, 9 through 14. And Jesus is talking in a parable about a couple guys. So he also told this parable to some who trusted in themselves that they were righteous and treated others with contempt. Well, what does contempt mean? The feeling that a person or a thing is beneath consideration. You know, sometimes I'm guilty of addressing my wife or my children or employees or co-workers in a manner of uh, contempt. I talk to them sometimes like they're beneath consideration or beneath me, and I haven't considered their thoughts or their feelings before I address them. Y'all have never done that, right? <laughs> Do sometimes we feel like when we go to pray and we try to come to God that we are beneath Him and that He is above reproach? I think sometimes we do. I think a lot of it has to do with our perspective as how we perceive ourselves versus how Christ perceives us. But you know, He's a heavenly Father and He's seated in high places, but He has never presented Himself to us that we are beneath Him and that He is above reproach. God is very approachable. As we continue on in this, in verse 10, two men went up into the temple to pray, one a Pharisee and one a tax collector. I think it's really interesting that of all the folks that people could have, God, Jesus could have used here as an example, he used a tax collector. So is there any IRS employees in the house? <laughs> Don't raise your hand. So, but apparently tax collectors weren't liked very much. Well, I understand, you know, and so I work hard and I like my money. And so the Pharisees, verse 11, the Pharisees, standing off by himself, prayed thus, God, I thank you that I'm not like other men, like extortioners, unjust, or like adulterers, or even like this guy, the tax collector. I fast twice a week. I give, up, I give tithes for all that I get. You think he had some pride? There's no humility there. When you pray, as we continue to, with uh, Luke, let's look at verses 13 and 14. We are called to pray mercifully. Merciful means treating people with kindness, not cruel or harsh, having or showing mercy. Have we been shown mercy? Sometimes we need to show a little mercy. Verse 13, But the tax collector, standing far off, <clears throat> would not even lift up his eyes to heaven, but beat his breast, saying, God, be merciful to me, a sinner. Now, the tax collector might not have been liked very much, but he knew exactly what he was. He knew that he was unjust. He knew that he was a sinner, and he presented himself that way to God. Not hoity, not prideful, but broken. Verse 14, I tell you, this man went down to his house justified rather than the other. For anyone who exalts himself will be humbled, but the one who humbles himself will be exalted. What does it mean to be justified? Well, to be justified, justified is declared or made righteous in the sight of God. I pulled my definitions from the Webster's Dictionary, by the way, and I find it to be very cool that even Webster understood to be justified meant it comes from God. The man that came before the throne, broken, with a contrite heart, and willing to be humble, was made righteous in God's sight. But the guy that came all hoity and puffed up, he was not. It says, I tell you, this man went down to his house justified rather than the other. The hypocrite's prayer is, God, thank you that I'm not like whatever, that guy. Have we ever prayed that way? And I tell you how we don't pray is we don't pray, get them, God, which often we do. 
especially when we're in conflict with somebody. I think that my wife has prayed a lot of times getting God, <laughs> and rightfully so. The believer's prayer is, thank you that you are a merciful God. Sometimes we need to pray, Lord, change me. Sometimes we're too caught up in ourselves to recognize that we're the ones that actually need to request forgiveness. The goal in prayer isn't to connect with or impress an audience. The goal is to connect with your audience of one. There you go. When you pray, you should pray privately. What's the privately mean? Privately used to refer to a situation when your thoughts and feelings aren't disclosed to others. I didn't, that's Webster's Dictionary, not me. And what that means is that sometimes when you pray, it doesn't need to be prayed on Facebook. Sometimes when we pray, we need to take time to go to our Heavenly Father and get direction before we go and confide in someone else. Sometimes confiding in someone else isn't always the best thing to do. So we look at Matthew 5, verse 6. But when you pray, go into your room and shut the door and pray to your Father who is in secret. And your Father who sees in secret will reward you. When I was uh, a younger man, I was able to go to Israel on a mission trip, which is awesome. Got to tour around, and we went to the Wailing Wall. And I don't know if you've ever been to Israel, but when folks go to pray at the Wailing Wall, it's not in secret. Uh, I mean, there's hundreds of people lined up, shoulder to shoulder, front to back, um, loudly expressing in their prayers. Um, it's kind of like when we were kids and we played the telephone game, you know, like I would come down here and I would tell Doug something in his ear. I may whisper to him, hey, Doug, uh, I sprained my pinky. All right, but by the time it wiggles its way all the way through the back and gets back there to the sound booth, it sounds a little bit like something of uh, I'm eating an asparagus Twinkie. <laughs> and I don't like asparagus, let alone asparagus Twinkie. The point is, is that if we don't take time to go to our Father in private first and get direction for how and who we should consult in or confide in, we might be making a mistake. And what started out is underwear left on the floor and she's mad at me is, did you hear that Matt and Tabitha are uh, moved out and he's living in the barn? And So be careful. Praying in private example would be Isaiah 16, excuse me, Isaiah 26 Verse 20, come, my people, enter your chambers and shut the doors behind you. Hide yourselves for a little while until the fury has passed by. This is an opportunity to battle in prayer before the throne of God, seeking his will in your prayer closet. But it is also a refuge to run and hide, to sit and soak in the presence of God and feel his peace while the storm rages outside. Now, I've brought with me today a few examples of places that I like to hide and pray. <laughs> well, come on. <clears throat> now, this is a great place. <clears throat> I mean, I'm going to tell you, y'all, I don't know if you're hunters or not, but those of you who are will understand there is nothing more tranquil in being in the vastness of God's creation than sitting in a deer stand quietly as the sun starts to rise and the woods wake up. I'm telling you. <laughs> and it really is a testament of God's creation and how things really work because just as the sun starts to come up, the birds will start to chirp. They start shaking off the dew from the night before. The squirrels come down and start rustling through the leaves to find their breakfast. It's an amazing thing. And just as the sun gets up just high enough to see, there is a massive eight-pointer in my food box. Thank you, Lord. Anyway, the next place I like to pray is in my truck. 
I do a lot of driving in my truck, uh, roaming around, checking on jobs, and so on and so forth, and I find it to be a great private place. That is a fantastic picture, by the way, uh, <laughs> as I chew on my sunglasses in great thought. Um, but the point is, is you need to take the time to find a place to hide and pray so that God can speak to you and you can have an opportunity to get to know him better. Privately battling, <clears throat> asking God for victory over sin in our lives, to give us eyes to see the very moment of temptation so we can stand against it, pleading for wisdom about how to parent, what to do next in your marriage, casting all of your worries and anxiety aside about bills and your health. We do battling in prayer. <clears throat> Write this down. That's for you, David. We don't battle in person. We battle in private. If we try to battle in person, face to face, that's called a conflict. And typically, if you haven't taken the time to battle in private and you come and battle in person, you are not going to have a resolution. It's just going to escalate and escalate. Privately shelter. Prayer is a place to sit with God as our hiding place. Rest in his peace when the world, when the world doesn't make sense or when it is completely obvious that the world is not our home. When you are in the throes of grief, disappointment, or anger, when you feel crushed by the realities of our marriage, parenting, health, finances, prayer is a fortress to ride out the storm. Now, I'm going to tell you right now, standing before you, that I have had some storms and found great shelter in prayer and in the Lord. I've been married 17 years to a wonderful wife, and I've got two great kids, you know, we've had some challenges. Um, one of my sons, when he was a, a toddler, was actually run over. And, and I'm not going to tell you which one, because then you're going to be like, well, that explains everything. <laughs> but the truth of the matter is that he came out unscathed. I'm talking about he didn't have road rash, he didn't have nothing. Now, the first two hours of the event, you know, chaos. But throughout it all, from start to finish, we prayed and we prayed and we prayed. We have had uh, loss of pregnancies in our marriage. Uh, we went through a time in our marriage uh, where it was, you know, really bad, where some stupid choices on my part caused us to be separated and pursuing divorce. But I stand before you right now because of persistence in prayer and because battling took place on my behalf even when I was unclear in my own direction in life and couldn't see the sin that I was living in. And so, you know, God is good. And if we take time to battle in prayer versus confront face-to-face -face in a battle, we're going to have much better um, outcome. When you pray, we are to pray thankfully. What does it mean to be thankful? Glad that something has happened or not happened in your life. You know, far too often we find ourselves praying, 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 God, I need this, I want that, gimme, gimme, gimme or we're looking for a certain type of answer in a situation, when all the while we may need to take a step back, get at 30,000 feet, and thank God for the things that hasn't happened in our life. There was a fantastic song by a, a wonderful musician by the name of Garth Brooks. <laughs> His song, Unanswered Prayers, it's the truth. It may be a secular country song, but it is the truth. Sometimes in our own ignorance, we don't know what we should pray for. Um, proceeding now, looking at <clears throat> uh, Matthew 6, verses 7. When you pray, do not heap up empty phrases as the Gentiles do, for they think they will be heard for their many words. Do not be like them, for your Father knows what you need before you ask Him. Gentiles here meaning people who don't know God as a provider who stress about what they will eat, what they will drink, or what they will wear. He is saying, don't pray like lost people. We are not lost people. If you are a lost person, there will be an opportunity today for you to no longer have to be the lost. But we are not lost people. So we can come to our Heavenly Father with everything that we need, earnestly and honestly and open. 
without worry or stress. The goal of prayer isn't to amass such a huge volume of words to persuade a distant God. The goal isn't even to inform a loving God about your life or your needs. You have an example of the prophets of Baal who stood and cried out and beat their chest, cut themselves. And I love how Elijah steps in and goes, hey, uh, maybe he's sleeping. Shout a little louder. I don't think you're getting your point across. The goal is to spend time with your Heavenly Father. You are talking to the one who created you, who adopted you, who loves you, who has forgiven all your sin, and who has given you all his righteousness and an eternal home in heaven. Remember, you are talking to the one who loves you so much he has taken up residence within your spirit. I love the Capital One commercials. We've got those barbarians that are running around bashing stuff. And, you know, what's the one thing they say is, what's in your wallet? <laughs> what's in your heart? Jesus. You know, it's not Capital One. Sometimes we forget that our Heavenly Father, Jesus, the person who died for our sins and saved us, resides in us. The Gatorade commercial, is it in you? What's in you? You aren't like the worshipers in 1 Kings 18 who thought the more they begged and the more they danced and the more they vowed and the more they inflicted pain that their God would answer. We don't have to do the song and dance, y'all. All we got to do is humbly ask. When you pray, the goal is quality time not quantity of words. Sometimes we need to come to him simply and just hang out. Those mornings in a deer stands, they're like hanging out. It's just hanging out. <clears throat> you are talking to your heavenly father who sees and knows what you need better than you can ask or want. Matthew 6, 25 through 34 reads, Therefore I tell you, do not be anxious about your life, what you will eat or what you will drink, nor about your body, what you will put on. Is not life more than food and the body more than clothing? Look at the birds in the air. They neither sow nor reap nor gather into barns, and yet your heavenly Father feeds them. Are you not of more value than they. What I really like about this, <clears throat> Matthew, verse 25, it says that we are not to worry about what we will eat, what we will drink, nor about your body. Does that mean that we can be gluttons and just shovel it in? No, it doesn't. But it also means, and I think it's really interesting, that as we continue to read, we're going to find this a few more times. And this is a mini sermon in the sermon. So what will you put on? Is not life more than food and the body more than clothing? You know, again, I've been married for 17 years, and I love my wife dearly. But I don't think there's a Sunday morning that goes by that she doesn't stand in the closet and in awe and in ponder and says, I have nothing to wear. <laughs> but a lot of us are that way. You know, and we get very concerned about what our outward appearance is and what other people are going to think versus just attempting to glorify God. Verse 27. And which of you, being anxious, can add a single hour to his lifespan? In any way, are you anxious about clothing? Consider the lilies of the field, how they grow. They neither toil nor spin. Yet I tell you, every I tell you, even Solomon in his glory was not arrayed like one of these. But if God so clothes the grass of the field, which today is alive and tomorrow is thrown into the oven, which he will he not much more clothe you, O ye of little faith? 
Therefore, do not be anxious. This is very important. Saying, what shall we eat? What shall we drink? Or what shall we wear? For the Gentiles will seek after all these things, and your heavenly Father knows that you need them. But seek first the kingdom of God and, its, and his righteousness, and all these things will be added to you. Therefore, do not be anxious about tomorrow, for tomorrow will be anxious about itself. Sufficient for the day is its own trouble. If we come to our Father in humility and we ask for the things that we need, then he will provide. We don't have to stress about it. We don't have to worry about it. We don't have to wring our hands. When we pray, we are called to pray passionately. What does it mean to be passionate? Passion is caused by intense feelings of love. Those of us that are married, we're very passionate about our spouse, right? Amen. And this passion was caused by intense feelings of love. If you're getting elbowed right now, then you're not loving your wife. Christ loves us passionately, which is why we are called to passionately pursue him. As we look at Matthew 26, 36, and 39, Then cometh Jesus with them unto a place called Gethsemane, and said unto his disciples, Sit here while I go yonder. Now we've got to pause here for just a moment and take a look at this word yonder. <laughs> Do you know what yonder means? Yes. Over there. Oh, yeah. It means yonder. This is proof. <laughs> But, well, hang on. This is proof that Jesus was a redneck. <laughs> now, I can't back that up, and there's no deep spiritual meaning here, so we're just going to proceed. That's right. Sit, he, sit ye here while I go yonder and pray. And he took with him Peter and two of the sons of Zebedee and began to be sorrowful and sore troubled. He was in pain, in agony, within his spirit. Then saith he unto them, My soul is exceeding sorrowful, even unto death. Abide ye here, and watch with me. Now I'm going to go back up to passionately for just a minute. Have you ever been so passionately in love, or in such passionate care or concern about someone that your soul ached for their well-being? and that you were concerned about the outcome of their life and how things were going to the point that you maybe found yourself interceding for them or praying for them and groaning, right? It's exactly what Jesus is doing right now for us because he passionately loved us. When I was younger, I used to read this, and I kind of would get upset because I thought, my Jesus is not a wimp. So why is he begging and asking and in sorrow for what's about to happen when he knows that he was born to die for our sins? What I come to understand and realize is that he wasn't mourning for his death. He was in agony and in great sorrow for the sinful nature that's within us that he was about to die to wipe away. Look at verse 39. And he went forward a little and fell on his face and prayed, saying, My father, if it be possible, let this cup pass away from me. Nevertheless, not as I will, but thou will be done. You know, it's one thing for me to go sit in a deer stand or pray in my truck or pray in the throne room, as was pictured. But it's another thing to find yourself prone, prostrate on the ground before your heavenly father interceding for something that's bigger than you can even begin to fathom and in a place where you know that his intervention is the only thing that's going to bring a change or a difference but that comes with great humility 
Our prayer life must be centered around God's will, not ours. The goal of prayer isn't to amass such a huge volume of words to persuade a distant God. The goal isn't even to inform a loving God about your life and your needs. The goal is to spend time with your Father. When we pray, we are to pray vigilantly. What does it mean to be vigilant? Kneeling watchful to detect danger or trouble, to be aware. You know, this is pretty important, especially as a Christian, because as a Christian, as soon as we said, Lord, I accept you, we volunteered to be under attack for eternity. And if we aren't vigilant and careful about how we enter into our prayer life and look for the things that are going on around us, then we're going to get gobbled up because Satan is always sitting, waiting to prowl and to trip us up and to bring things into our life that are going to cause us to fail. Matthew 26, 40 through 46. <clears throat> and he cometh unto his disciples and finding them sleeping and said unto Peter, What? That was from uh, Despicable Me. Yes. <laughs> Could you not watch with me one hour? He, Jesus was only asking for one hour, y'all. Watch and pray. Now, Jesus, who the disciples loved and respect, and they knew that he was of great purpose and significance, gave them a commandment, watch and pray, that ye not enter into temptation. Now, they're out in the woods, and Jesus is off praying. And he's asking them to watch and pray that they not enter into temptation. What, what temptation was there for them to potentially enter into or could be coming their way? Now, I don't know. But this is very important because God has called us to watch and pray as Christians so that we not enter into temptation. Because our spirit indeed is welling, but as we know, our flesh is weak. And again, a second time he went away and prayed, saying, My father, if, it, if this cannot pass away except I drink it, thy will be done. Sometimes we go and we pray and we don't get an answer and we go on about our life. And we say, well, I guess God wasn't that into it this time. Even Jesus went three times, three times, y'all, to make sure that he had the right answer. Stop giving up after the first turnaround in the prayer closet. Go back again and again. And he came again and found them sleeping, for their eyes were heavy. And he left them again and went away and prayed a third time, saying again the same words. Then cometh he to the disciples and said unto them, Sleep on now and take your rest. Behold, the hour is at hand. And the Son of Man is betrayed into the hands of the sinners. Arise, let us be going. Behold, he is at hand that betrayeth me. Jesus was needing his disciples, his beloved twelve, to have his back. And all they could do was catch a nap. One of the really important reasons why we need to pray and pursue Christ in prayer is because I need your back. And if you look to the right, that person needs your back. And if you look to the left, that person needs your back. But if we're not consistently in prayer and building up our life, spiritual lives, we can't be vigilant to see temptation when it's coming, not only for ourselves, but for our feather brother or sister. When we pray, we are called to pray consistently, constantly, continuously over a period of time. 1 Thessalonians 5, 16 and 18 reads, Rejoice always. Pray without ceasing. We are to rejoice when? Always. We are to pray without what? 
So would you say that we're called to pray all the time? Mm -hmm. And everything give thanks, for this is the will of God in Christ Jesus. We should live in a state of constant intersex intercession, seeking the face of God so that we may know His voice and be able to respond when He speaks to us. How often do we miss the opportunity to be used by God simply because we are not tuned in to His voice? Now, I want to ask you guys a question. If I took all the parents in this place and I lined them up against this wall, specifically the mothers, because guys are not always tuned in, and I took all the children of those mothers and I lined them up against this wall, and all the mothers, I blindfolded you, and I had one child step forth and say, Mama, would you know your child? I think you would. How often is our Jesus calling out to us and we can't hear him because we don't know his voice? And we're missing opportunities and missing opportunities and missing opportunities to be used because we can't hear and don't know his voice because we haven't spent time listening and learning what that sounds like. Write this down. <clears throat> If we only pray when we have a need, then we are panic prayers and are missing out on the fellowship that our Heavenly Father longs for. Now, in my house, I have a nickname because I'm self-employed. We, we run our own business, and, you know, sometimes we, we mail out invoices, and we're needing these things that come called checks. So... I'm known as the mail hawk because every day at the same time I run out and check the mail. You know, and there's been many times where my wife has called me out and said, you're living on the provision of what the mailman is bringing and not on the provision of what God has for us. And that is so true. And it's like, yeah, but I got to make payroll. <laughs> but the truth is, is that if I sit down and I chill out and I let God be God, the truth of the matter is, is that in seven years, we have not missed a payroll. Now, I have an example for you guys that I want to show you. Um, it's really important for us to be able to be vessels of the Lord, right? But it's also just as important for us to be able to be used and for God to be able to flow through us. Now, my disclaimer here is that I am an electrician, and don't try this at home. <laughs> So this here, y'all, is a normal everyday drop cord. There's absolutely nothing special about it. There's nothing up this sleeve, and there's nothing up this sleeve. Now, I will tell you, if the power goes out, the exits are to the right and to the left <laughs> and out the back. This is a plug tester. We use it to make sure that the outlet's working right. Can everybody see those little orange lights right there? I know it's kind of bright up here. So this is hot, okay, right? It works. This thing right here is what we call in the industry is a hot stick. That's not really what it's called, but that's what we call it. So what happens is when it detects current, it starts hollering at you. So if I want to know if I got a hot wire, I'll lay this on it, so on and so forth. So sometimes, you know, it's easy for us to come up to God, bring our knees to Him and go, yep, you're there. You know what? Okay, you're still there. Maybe I, uh, maybe I want to hang out here for a while and just spend some time with God. Calm down. <laughs> I told you I'm a professional. <laughs> oh, all right, that's right. So now I know, I know that he's here, and I've got him. Okay, and he's got me, right? And that's great. I mean, there's nothing wrong with this. There's nothing wrong with hanging out with God. It's still hot. There's no tricks here. It got me. So, but what we're really called to do is to be a conductor and let God flow through us so we can be used. Because if all we do is sit and soak in the presence of God, then what happens is we sour and we are of no use to Him. So I challenge you to not only be a vessel, to be a conductor for the Holy Spirit. Spend some time in your prayer closet, in your throne room in a deer stand 
whatever. Learn the voice of God so that when it's time for you to be used, you can respond the way he's intended. What happened for a moment there was I got distracted and I got shocked. <laughs> and that happens in life, right? We get distracted. As I wrap up here, I challenge you guys to come and pray. Come humbly, pray mercifully, in private, giving thanks passionately with a vigilant heart, leaving here today in a constant state of prayer.